Hello, and welcome back. This is the lecture for week 11 of the Philosophy of Science course with me, Scott Marlino. These slides cover the 11th week of the course. For this set of slides, read Handout 5 and Okasha Chapters 4 and 5. Explore also the links I have to additional content in Canvas, Module 5. This week's main question, what limits science? In this lecture, I summarize what I think are the major limitations on scientific reasoning for people who do science and the rest of us who trust and rely upon science. These issues are not unique to science, as they corrupt historical and religious reasoning as well. However, I focus here only on how such limits affect scientific accuracy and reliability, and ultimately our choices of which theories to accept and which to reject. Did Caesar cross the Rubicon in 49 AD? Did Jesus of Nazareth resurrect from the dead? All we have are oft-repeated stories from writers and believers who were born after these events. None of this evidence is testable. No alleged witnesses can be cross-examined, as we should or would in a court of law, for the evidence standards are not even as rigorous as those used in science. Here's my list of what limits science. Let's begin with sex bias and weird bias. Sex bias affects accuracy. It turns out that research done on males alone often does not apply across the sexes. In 1993, the National Institutes of Health Revitalization Act mandated that women and minorities be included in clinical research because treatments had been shown to have different effects in different populations. A 2001 Institute of Medicine report published by the National Academies Press pointed to evidence that the same was true for research using animal models. The sex of the animal can lead to qualitatively different results. Male rats and mice <clears throat> Male rats and mice have become the default animal model for many diseases because they are easier and cheaper to work with than females. This bias compromises the safety and effectiveness of drugs in women, although it's not clear exactly how much. For example, 10 drugs were withdrawn from the market between 1997 and 2000 because of adverse health effects. According to a 2001 U.S. General Accounting Office report, eight of them pose higher risks for women than for men, and in four of those, the risk was likely due to physiological differences. A weird view of human nature skews psychologist studies. Although undergraduates from wealthy nations are numerous and willing research subjects, psychologists are beginning to realize that they have a drawback. They are weirds, that is. They are people from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic cultures. In a review paper published recently, a pair of researchers argued that weirds aren't representative statistically of humans as a whole, and that psychologists routinely use them to make broad and quite likely false claims about what drives human behavior. Consider the horizontal lines in the Mueller liar illusion. People in industrialized societies often think the top line is shorter than the bottom one. But that illusion is weaker or absent in some small-scale societies whose members perceive the lines as equally long. Weird bias also affects accuracy. Even though the lines are of equal length, people from different societies perceive them differently. What about publication bias? I've mentioned this already, but this is where researchers, editors, and pharmaceutical companies tend to handle the reporting of experimental results that are positive. That is, they show a significant finding, differently from results that are inconclusive or negative, that is, supporting the null hypothesis. So more positive results than negative results get published. Few failed attempts to replicate results get published. The effect of publication bias on clinical research has driven the development of registries, such as clinicaltrials.gov, in which clinical trials are logged before they begin. Can animal models of disease reliably inform human studies? Again, publication bias is any systematic distortion of an intervention effect away from the truth caused by inadequacies in the design, conduct, or analysis of an experiment. 
Publication bias is prevalent in reports of laboratory-based research in animal models of stroke such that data from as many as 1 in 7 experiments remains unpublished. So, reviews of published results of drug interventions in animal models of stroke overstate their efficacy by around one-third. Non-publication of data raises ethical concerns as well. First, because the animals used have not contributed to the sum of human knowledge, and second, because participants in subsequent clinical trials may be put at unnecessary risk if efficacy in animals has been overstated. This probably also plays a substantial role in the experimental literature for other diseases. There is increasing concern that most current published research findings are false. Here's John Ioannidis on this. The probability that a research claim is true depends on study power to reject the null hypothesis and systematic bias. The number of other studies on the same question and, importantly, the ratio of true to no relationships among the relationships probed in each scientific field. In this framework, a research finding is less likely to be true when the studies conducted in a field are smaller, when effect sizes are smaller, when there is a greater number and lesser pre-selection of tested relationships, where there is greater flexibility in designs, definitions, outcomes, and analytical models. They're less likely to be true when there is greater financial and other interest and prejudice. And when more teams are involved in a scientific field in chase of statistical significance. Simulations show that for most study designs and settings, it is more likely for a research claim to be false than true. Moreover, for many current scientific fields, claimed research findings may often be simply accurate measures of the prevailing bias. Further, the truth wears off. The effectiveness of antipsychotics and antidepressants decreases the longer patients use them. These pharmaceuticals tend not to work as well over time or not to work at any better rates than placebos in subsequent clinical trials. Positive results from previous studies become unrepeatable. We cannot replicate formally positive outcomes. Is this poor design? confounding, or something else. When experiments are done, we still have to choose what to believe. Recall that we've discussed cognitive biases. For instance, we talked about confirmation bias, which is the tendency for people to prefer information that confirms their preconceptions or hypotheses they believe already, independently of whether they are true. For example, design in nature implies a designer. I'll have more to say about that example shortly. There are also other issues. Uh, here's another one I have not mentioned, the clustering illusion. This is the tendency to see patterns where actually none exist. Our brains are good at this. Random events like successive repeating die tosses seem non-random, ordered, or impossible when they are not. And I also mentioned a number of selection biases, in particular base rate neglect and availability bias, as serious sources of error. I've also mentioned fallacious thinking as something which limits our understanding of science. Again, fallacious thinking, I discussed this in lectures 1 through 6. Fallacious thinking is any defective reasoning that contains an error, either in its formal or informal logic or its assumptions. Recall these three major fallacies, the after this, therefore because of this, thinking or the post hoc fallacy moving the goalposts or changing the subject or what I called hypothesis shifting. And further, the third I thought was the most important was the shifting of the burden of proof or the appeal to ignorance fallacy. Review these from the lectures and the notes. There are other examples of fallacious thinking, poor reasoning, not merely bias, but actual mistakes in concluding based on observations and alleged evidence. There's something called the sharpshooter fallacy where you select or adjust a hypothesis after data is collected, making it impossible to test the hypothesis fairly. I mentioned also, and we discussed a video from Elizabeth Loftus on false memories where we confuse imagined memories with actual, you know, recollections of true events where we confuse true memories with false memories. There's also, of course, wishful thinking, where you form beliefs or make decisions according to what is pleasing or useful to imagine, 
instead of by appeal to evidence or rationality. We also need to take care that confident or charismatic individuals do not persuade us to believe things for which we have little or no evidence. Perceived charisma inhibits the frontal executive network of believers in intercessory prayer. This is where people pray for people to get better. When people fall under the spell of a charismatic figure, areas of the brain responsible for skepticism and vigilance become less active. That's the finding of a study which looked at people's response to prayers spoken by someone purportedly possessing divine healing powers. To identify the brain processes underlying the influence of charismatic people, Ufa Schott of Erhus University in Denmark and colleagues turned to Christians who believe that some people have divinely inspired powers of healing, wisdom, and prophecy. Using functional magnetic resonance imaging, Schott and colleagues scanned the brains of 20 Christians and 20 non-believers while playing them recorded prayers. The volunteers were told that six of the prayers were read by a non-Christian six by an ordinary Christian, and six by a healer. In fact, all were read by ordinary Christians. Only in the devout volunteers did the brain activity monitored by researchers change in response to the prayers. Is there a similar response to doctors, parents, and politicians? What we can derive from this small pilot study, provisionally, tentatively, is that who you think is praying for you affects whether you get well or feel like you get well. Okay, let's continue with the list of things I believe limits science. Anti-realism is on that list. It's not anti-scientific, but it constrains the scope of our descriptions and explanations of nature in such a way that we can really only talk about what we observe with any confidence. And yet much of what we have to deal with is unobservable. So here are some of the concerns anti-realism raises. A theory can explain, but not be accurate. This is what it means for a theory to be useful, but not necessarily truthful, believable. For example, cats hate mice. Space aliens visit Earth and leave crop circles. Cats hating mice explains why they chase the mice. Space aliens visiting Earth explains the crop circles. However, there are better explanations. In fact, we think those explanations are actually false. Now that we know crop circles are deliberate hoaxes, and the cats don't need to hate mice to chase them, they just need to want to eat them. A theory can also describe phenomena but not explain. In fact, theories seem to be useful because of their descriptive capability, and yet we're really not getting at what causes, what makes people to be hyperactive or to be introverted as opposed to extroverted. Also, false but plausible explanations explain too. But only the realist has a problem because the realist seeks truth. Non-realists get a useful model for accepting successful explanations. And what anti-realists offer us is empirical adequacy. We need only accept theories that account for what we observe. That's all. Theories then are tentative, provisional, temporary. Observations alone are not sufficiently informative. In fact, empirical evidence by itself underdetermines theories, that is, which theories we accept or believe. So for the anti-realists, some useful theories model reality but need not be true. They must only be empirically adequate. And again, a theory is empirically adequate when whatever it asserts about observable phenomena in a model of the real world is true of the model, but not necessarily true of the world. Let's talk more about underdetermination. This is new in this lecture. There are three main points. All observation is theory-laden, and I'll explain what that is. Evidence often underdetermines theory choice. There's too often insufficient evidence to determine whether one theory is better, more acceptable, perhaps believable than another. And there is always this gap between theory and evidence. I'm specifically referring to here what limits science on my handout number five. Let's focus on the all-observation-is-theory-laden claim. Observed objects and their properties are constituted in part by a Weltanschauung, a worldview or conceptual scheme. Observations and the theories. Observations and theories are interrelated, and so neither can be an independent foundation for the other. 
Consider the discovery of Neptune, observing perturbations in the orbit of Uranus, depended on numerous assumptions, some false. Galileo thought Neptune was a star, not a planet, because when he looked at it in 1612, it did not appear to be moving from Earth's perspective, because Neptune was in retrograde. That's when a planet appears to be going backwards in its orbit. From the vantage point of Earth, planets exhibit retrograde mo uh, motion, which is only apparent, not real. As Earth passes a, a superior planet such as Mars, the superior planet will temporarily appear to reverse its motion across the sky. And this was not believed to be the behavior of a planet if it's actually orbiting a star. This is our current model of the solar system and the arrangement of the planets. And our Hansen makes the case that all observations are theory-laden, so there is no theory-neutral observational language. And to say that observations are theory-laden is to say there are no observations which do not have assumptions based already on theoretical explanations. If this is correct, proponents of different theories can't observe the same things in an effort to decide between their theories. Each theorist is effectively isolated within a world of observations consistent with his or her theoretical beliefs. There's no way of determining which among the rival theories is correct because there are no standard criteria. I mean, how much do interpretations influence what one sees? And what is this? Is it a rabbit? Is it a pelican? Backing away farther? Now it's looking more like, well, still, rabbits and pelicans. Let's back off even farther. Now we see antelopes. And the point here is that observations are interpretations. There are no assumption-free, theory-free, unbiased observations. How much do interpretations influence what we see? Against one background, we see one thing, a rabbit or a pelican, but against another, it's something else, say an antelope. Once we realize that interpretation shapes what we see, you have to grant that seeing the figure under the pelican interpretation and seeing it under the antelope interpretation I'm out to seeing two different things. And so this is theory ladenness. Science always proceeds from within a worldview. Different theories require or produce different worldviews. Two people watch a sunrise, but see different phenomena. Identical elements are arranged conceptually by each person's mind in vastly different ways. What is happening when we look at a sunrise? For the geocentrist, the person who thinks Earth is at the center of our solar system, it's the sun that's moving. For a heliocentrist, it's the Earth that's moving around the sun. Very different conceptions of what's actually going on. Same world, different worldviews. Theory ladenness consists in three theses, one about observation, one about meanings of terms, and the last about facts. Observation is theory laden. Observing X is always shaped by prior assumptions about X, the nature of X. For example, geocentrists versus heliocentrists see the sun rise differently. Sunrise versus horizon lowering. Pessimists versus optimists see the glass of water differently. Is the glass half full or half empty? Meanings, too, are theory dependent. Descriptive terms acquire meanings specific to theories using them. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Facts as well are theory-laden. What counts as a fact depends on the worldview associated with a theory. For example, complex organisms are necessarily designed by God in fact or evolved via natural selection where no gods are necessary to that process. So rival theories, theories depending upon particular worldviews, have very different assumptions about what counts as a fact. Let's take the first thesis that observing X is always shaped by prior assumptions about X. Two people watch a sunrise but see different phenomena. Identical elements are arranged conceptually by each person's mind in vastly different ways. For example, that natural objects appear designed by an intelligent, powerful being follows somewhat from our ability to find complex patterns in nature as improbable, useful, and usually the products of intelligent design. But random mutation and non-random natural selection may produce and preserve such traits, as long as they are not harmful. Consider the batfish in the next slide. Those big red Mick Jagger lips must have a purpose, right? 
Not necessarily, though some females may be attracted to them, in which case they may increase the fitness of those males having them. But these traits do not seem to be specific to males. They're also present in females. The point is, we don't see how those red lips could be random, not have something to do with the survival rates, the reproductive rates of these animals. Let's look at thesis two, meanings are theory-laden. Descriptive terms acquire meanings specific to theories that use them. Principles of a theory help determine the meanings of theoretical and observational terms. The language used to express what we believe influences how we sense that what we see is what we can believe. Thus, meanings of terms will change as a result of shifting from one theory to another. For instance, are biological traits intelligently designed? For example, we observe design in nature. Say that a complex functional trait, such as an eye or a wing, implies a designer. Doesn't it? Only if we believe already that every case of apparent design in complex traits is evidence of an actual designer who intends to produce that function. But this fails to consider that design may be the product of a natural, unintentional process. It might be that there are cases of apparent design where design does not imply an intentional designer. Where design could be something completely different, something without intentions or plans, namely a natural process. Look at this crab, one claw big, one claw small. Is this trait, this giant claw, designed or evolved? Two rival theories, intelligent design theory versus modern evolutionary theory. Does this crab have a large claw because it has a purpose? For which it was intelligently designed? Or does the crab have a large claw because it lost the other claw recently and the smaller one is regenerating? So it's not that the big one has an advantage that God gave it. It's, it's not that it has a specific function. It, it might. It's not that it was purposely designed by a supernatural being. It could be that it looks big in proportion to the smaller one because the smaller one is one that's regrowing the result of an entirely natural, unintentional process. Consider then the reasoning behind each principle and whatever conclusions each entails. Two principles. If one has a trait, T, then it must be there for a reason. It has a purpose. This is in us, something we think. If trait T did not have a purpose, then it wouldn't be there. And this gets incorporated into a design argument, an argument about design and nature implying a designer, or only being able to explain the complexity in nature as a result of intelligent design. Here's the argument. Organisms would not have trait T if it were not useful for some function, say, X. But trait T is useful for some function X, therefore organisms have trait T for some function. But notice that this assumption presumes what it needs to prove. For example, accepting assumption 1 about what traits are, that is, traits have functions, useful functions, requires already accepting the conclusion, which you're supposed to be proving first. Organisms have trait T for some function. You wouldn't conclude that unless you already believed that, which is what we're doing in claim one. So the argument is compelling if you already accept what you need to prove. This is circular reasoning. Let's take the third thesis. Facts are theory dependent. What counts as a fact depends upon the worldview associated with a the theory. There are no theory neutral or language independent facts established by empirical observations. Naive observers of nature who do not consider alternative explanations think everything has a purpose. So in the natural world, one sees functions where there need be none and purposes where there are only functions. And this gets a little confusing. Functions are not the same things as purposes. Functions are what something does. Purposes are more than that. Purposes are intended outcomes or goals of an intellect. Purposes fulfill plans. Designers have purposes. Artists have purposes. So functions are not the same things as purposes. Something could have a function, but that might not be its purpose. One function of my nose sticking out from my face is that it holds my glasses up. Is that its purpose? Another function of my nose is that it creates a 
space to pull in and warm and filter air as it enters my sinuses. Is that its purpose? Well, for it to be its purpose, there needs to have been some sort of designer. And if I think everything has a reason or a purpose, then I'm already thinking everything has a designer. To say that something has a function is to say it's useful, perhaps even beneficial, but not necessarily designed. To say that something has a purpose is to say it's intentionally made. I need to make clear what theory ladenness is not. It's not the idea that an observer can see anything he or she wants to see. It's not the idea that the world is a product of the activity of my own or some other mind. It's not the idea that scientists are biased. They see what they want to see, that is, whatever would confirm their theories, and ignore what they do not want to see, which would refute their theories. And it's not the idea that different observers see the same thing, but interpret it, interpret what they see differently. Let's continue with underdetermination. What is the relation between theory and evidence? Pierre Duhem famously said, evidence is, strictly speaking, incapable of dictating theory, or hypothesis choice, since multiple mutually incompatible theories can have the same relation to any given body of evidence. In science, there's this gap then between theory and evidence. If you plot finitely many points on a sheet of paper, observational data, you can then draw unimaginably many curves, the theories, through them. And so any theory is underdetermined whenever, given the available evidence, there is a rival theory which is inconsistent with that theory that is at least as consistent with the same evidence. Underdetermination threatens scientific realism. Our best theories might not be approximately true at all. They're just consistent with evidence. We cannot be assured of the truth of our best theories since unconceived alternatives are always possible. Here's a simple example of underdetermination from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. If all I know is that you spent $10 on apples and oranges, and that apples cost $1 while oranges cost $2, then I know you did not buy six oranges. But I don't know whether theory one, you bought one orange and eight apples, or theory two, two oranges and six apples, and so on. Other theories are compatible with the same evidence. Thus, our theoretical beliefs about unobservable phenomena and our beliefs based on observations are insufficiently settled by sensory evidence. Do we then never have good empirical reasons for choosing one theory over another? Let's look at a couple of cases of underdetermination. Let's talk about some examples of underdetermination. One case abstract, the other case more concrete. Case one. Multiple curves may be drawn through the same set of data points, plotting the change in the length of a metal bar as its temperature increases. Now, which theory is most probable? Theory A, theory B, theory C. Notice these are very different curvy lines through the same data. The straight line hypothesis, theory A, only seems more probable than the others until we realize that infinitely many other theories are consistent with the same data. Thus, theory A is underdetermined by the evidence thus far. The point. Anti-realists think most of our theories are like this, so we should suspend belief in any of them, even if they are accurate about observables and predictions. Realists think such underdetermination is not common, and that this does not imply that most theories are equally supported by available data. Here's the second case of underdetermination, the case of Thomas Jefferson's DNA. Jefferson's DNA matches that found in descendants of his slave, Sally Hemings. Did he father some of her children? But evidence supports rival hypotheses, too. Let's look at this. This is the family tree of Thomas Jefferson, beginning with his paternal grandfather, Thomas Jefferson the Elder, and it goes all the way down to presently existing people, people from whom we've got DNA samples. Included on this list are descendants of his slave Sally Hemings, who it turns out share segments of DNA, massive seg segments of DNA with Jefferson's family. A little closer look, closer look at the bottom. So who is Sally Hemings? She was an enslaved woman and uh, the mother of several children at least one of whom, Eston, 
appears to be the son of Thomas Jefferson, whose deceased wife, Martha Wales, was Sally's half-sister. Now, there are no known photos of Sally or Eston, and here are my sources. Follow these links for more details. The Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello affirms that Thomas is Eston's father, and you can look at their evidence summary here. Here's a look at that abstract of the study from 1998 that concluded that Jefferson fathered Sally Hemings' last child, Eston. Now, there are alternative hypotheses here. There are alternative hypotheses. Another male, say, in the Jefferson line fathered Sally Hemings' last child, perhaps a brother or uncle, which accounts for the DNA match as well. The point in this example is that there is insufficient evidence to rule these other explanations out thus. Any theory about who fathered Eston is underdetermined. Here's Pierre Duhem from the early 1900s. He makes the case that evidence is, strictly speaking, incapable of dictating theory or hypothesis choice, since multiple mutually incompatible theories can have the same relation to any given body of evidence. When evidence is insufficient to determine which theories are best or true, we say that the choice of which theory to accept is underdetermined by evidence. In such cases, we are not justified in accepting any theory. That a theory predicts what we do in fact observe is not enough, especially when other theories predict the same outcomes. For instance, beliefs about unobservables, such as subatomic particles, physical forces, souls, or gods, are underdetermined by empirical evidence. Other important rivalries between popular theories exhibit the same problem. This amazing complexity and diversity in nature can be explained by gods or natural processes. Allow me to continue discussing the case of apparent design in nature. And in my example, I've been focusing on complex biological features, traits, characters, or adaptations of organisms. What I'm doing here is contrasting two rival explanations that of intelligent design versus biological evolution. Now, I know some of you are thinking that these aren't really rivals. They actually are compatible. There is a way in which they are compatible, but only if we lose some of the core presumptions of the traditional intelligent design theory. And if we want to merge the two together, what we're going to find is that any version of a theory which includes both God did it and nature did it is really a version of intelligent design. I'll get back to this in the last lecture in this course when I discuss incompatibilities between the scientific worldview and the mainstream religious worldview. In this slide, you'll see what biologists call the pentadactyl limb. In each of these four limbs of these six animals, humans, horses, cats, bats, birds, and whales, You'll see you've got five digits, two bones, one big bone. Big bone is the humerus, then you've got the radius and the ulna, and then you've got carpals, metacarpals. In each of these creatures, these four limbs do different things. They have different functions. So in the bat, the extended fingers of the hand enable the animal to fly, whereas in Primates, you've got the five digits, the hand enables climbing, grasping. And in horses, you've got the extended wrist bone, the fused digits, which make it a superior runner. In whales, you've got this forelimb that works really well as a paddle. How do we make sense of all this? What we have here is a case of under determination of theory by evidence. Here is something we need to explain. We observe that organisms are well suited. Here is something we need to explain. We observe that organisms are well suited to their environment and their complex anatomical structures appear to have been designed for enabling each to survive and reproduce successfully. Theory one. Call this the intelligent design theory. God designed organisms and their complex adaptations. Nature alone could not have done this. Theory two. Call this the evolutionary theory. 
physical, chemical, biological processes without divine intervention produced organisms and their complex adaptations. Nature alone could not have done this. What you need to see is that T1 and T2, as stated, are incompatible. One says, nature alone could not have produced this apparent design, and the other says nature alone could have done this. T1 and T2 then are mutually exclusive. You need to choose one over the other. Are there any other viable theories which the same set of evidence supports? Again, a theory which would combine the two would have to drop essential assumptions. If you want to combine the two into a God did it and used nature theory, then you need to drop the assumption that nature alone could have done this. A God did it and used evolution theory cannot include the assumption that nature alone could have done this. And so you see you've just dismissed theory two and really accepted a version of theory one. This slide illustrates the common structures of these animals by looking at their forelimbs. And for biologists, this common structure implies, probably, they share common ancestors. Let's review a little here. Empiricism, positivism, and underdetermination have this in common. Many empiricists and others argue that there will always be a range of alternative theories compatible with all of our actual evidence. This makes it hard to choose rationally one theory over others. Now, underdetermination is the idea that sometimes more than one theory accounts for the same observed evidence. In such cases, no set of evidence uniquely determines one theory decisively above all of its competitors. Again, review the discussion of underdetermination in the Okasha text, page 71 through 76. If all theories about what exists and happens and the propositions derived from them are not sufficiently determined by empirical data, then each theory with an empirically adequate interpretation of the evidence is equally justifiable, at least under the anti-realist perception. Thus, the Greeks' worldview of Homeric gods looks as credible as the physicist's world of elementary particles and forces. So this indeterminacy of data to theory shows there is no good way to certify a theory based on any set of empirical evidence. This is not to dismiss such evidence. We're just saying that the evidence doesn't dictate which theory we should choose. So any theory or statement or belief is underdetermined if, given the available evidence, there is a rival theory which is inconsistent with the theory that is at least as consistent with all the same evidence. Here is Willard Van Orman Quine from his famous 1951 paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Science is a continuation of common sense, and it continues the common sense expedient of swelling ontology to simplify theory. And by swelling ontology, he means positing, thinking perhaps, that more exists than we previously thought. So if your theory about what exists says that Ultimately, everything is composed of atoms, atoms being indivisible by definition. It falls short when you want to describe certain physical and chemical interactions that are too complex to explain by talking about atoms alone. So we posit that there are these subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, to simplify our explanations to produce better theories. He goes on, as an empiricist, I continue to think of the conceptual scheme of science as a tool ultimately for predicting future experience in the light of past experience. Physical objects are conceptually imported into the situation as convenient intermediaries, not by definition in terms of experience, but simply as irreducible posits comparable epistemologically to the gods of Homer. For my part, I do, as a lay physicist, believe in physical objects and not in Homer's gods. And I consider it a scientific error to believe otherwise. But in point of epistemological footing, he's talking here about what we can justifiably believe. The physical objects and the gods differ only in degree and not in kind. Both sorts of entities enter our conceptions only as cultural posits. The gods explain, and so too do physics explain. Now we have to decide which explanation is better, more economical, 
testable, presumes fewer unobservables exist. I now move to the last part of this lecture where I discuss in particular Thomas Kuhn and his famous work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where he gives an account of how scientific change is often revolutionary. We'll discuss incommensurability and paradigm shifts. For this part of this lecture, look again at handout five, especially the last section on Kuhn and scientific revolutions. You should look at this before continuing this lecture if you have not done so already. Terms and concepts are incommensurable between rival or successor theories. What does it mean, incommensurable? We'll talk about this. Paradigm shifts. When paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. What could Kuhn mean by this? Major scientific change occurs when paradigms shift. For instance, heliocentrism replaced geocentrism. Evolution replaced creationism. These are literally revolutions in science. There are a couple of videos I want you to watch. The first is on the idea of scientific revolutions. Here, the speaker prevents some instances of scientific revolutions in the history of science. Now, Kuhn thought the development of a science in the history of science isn't uniform or cumulative, but has alternating normal and revolutionary phases. Here, too, is the second video I want you to watch on YouTube. This one focuses more on Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions. Have a look at this. This guy does a good job better than I can do. Have a look. From Thomas Kuhn, we get a new model of scientific change and the developed insight that scientific methods have a socially dependent aspect. In his Structure of Scientific Revolutions, published in 1962, Thomas Kuhn, a physicist, historian, and philosopher of science at MIT, describes scientific revolutions as shifts in a paradigm, that is, a package of ideas about the world. Methods for gathering and analyzing data, vocabulary, and habits of scientific thought and activity. This is the most famous book about science from the 20th century. I want to call your attention to a diagram I have on handout 5, which describes the revolutionary character of paradigm shifts and the cyclical nature of science. Normal science, the activity in which most scientists inevitably spend almost all their time, is predicated on the assumption that the scientific community knows what the world is like. There's no huge debate about the ultimate nature of reality. Normal science is what we're in the middle of right now when we're trying to find a vaccine for a new virus that emerges that makes a lot of people sick. Normal science is looking for treatments, vaccines. For Kuhn, a paradigm is a disciplinary matrix with four essential elements. There are these symbolic generalizations where we describe what we call accepted laws of nature and definitions. Here we have Newton's laws of motion being worked out and Mendel's laws of heredity. Again, laws aren't so much rules we have to follow. The cosmos doesn't follow rules. The idea here is that there are these general things we can say about what we observe that we presume is evidence of regularity or uniformity in nature. There are these metaphysical presumptions about what actually is going on exists, uh, perhaps even underlies observations. For example, atoms being the fundamental bits of matter, or not, or light being a wave or a particle. Species, are they unchanging, basic, created kinds of organisms? Or are they parts of evolving lineages? A paradigm also has a set of values. Accuracy of description and prediction, consistency, simplicity, fruitfulness, puzzle-solving success. See these six criteria from before. Exemplars, that is, textbook or laboratory examples that students learn to do. For example, in physics, you'll do the double split experiment that shows light's diffraction patterns. You'll do plant hybridizing or fruit fly breeding as models for demonstrated accepted genetic principles. These examples show how a paradigm within a discipline solves problems. Here's an old world view, Bible-based, The Special Creation of Animals. It's depicted in this painting from the 1550s by Jacobo Tintoretto. Notice the unicorn here, God in the middle, making the animals, fish, birds. This is an old world view, an old paradigm. In fact, the foundation of science, up until I'd say about the middle 1700s, 
but not entirely superseded or replaced by modern science, which occurs, I, I'd say, after Darwin. And here's what we got now. This is an evolutionary tree diagram depicting historical causal relations between species. This is the new worldview or paradigm after Darwin. Notice the descent from a common ancestral group, presumption. On Kuhn's view, terms and concepts and theories are incommensurable, incompatible, between rival or successor theories. Why do scientific revolutions make paradigms or theories incommensurable? For that argument, see section 9 of handout 5. I want to focus on these two main ideas. Two theories are incommensurable when, for instance, their terms have incompatible meanings. You can't translate claims within one theory into claims of another theory. For instance, does the term gravity describe an attractive force between objects? That was Newton's idea. Or does gravity describe the curvature of space-time? Very different. That's Einstein. Incommensurability challenges positivists. The old paradigm about how science works who think science is logical, empirical, objective, describing the world, and they're not influenced by prior beliefs, and realists who say science is cumulative, progressive, knowledge generating. I list more examples of incommensurables on the next slide. In the history of science, fundamental assumptions of competing views within a discipline are or become inconsistent. So traditional and new paradigms are incompatible because the same terms have different meanings. This provokes a revolutionary change. Normal science cannot continue until these anomalies, inconsistencies, are resolved. Among the ancients, disease is divine punishment or demonic possession. We moderns now think disease is systemic disorder or germ infection. Geocentrists believe Earth is central, unmoving, flat. Heliocentrists believe Earth is orbiting the Sun. It's spinning, tilting, wobbling, and it is spherical. For Newton, in Newtonian mechanics, mass is an invariant quantity, where space is absolute. For Einstein, mass is a variant quantity. Space is relativistic. The traditional Linnaean concept of the species was basically biblical, that is, that each was separately created, unchanging, and that there are only a finite number of them. The modern synthetic theory of species says otherwise, namely that they are emergent, evolving, infinite in variety. Prior to Darwin, organismal traits have divine causes, or foreordained intentional purposes. After Darwin, traits are either deleterious, bad, neutral, or advantageous in effect. That is, they have functions, but they're not necessarily purposes. And right now, humans, once regarded as unique, godlike paragons of divine creation, are now regarded as a kind of large, bipedal, savanna ape, descendant of monkeys. Those are some serious paradigm shifts. So this is what Kuhn means when he says terms and concepts are incommensurable between rival or successor theories. Researchers in different paragraphs see the world in a different way because they use different schemes of classification, a different vocabulary even. Their scientific training and prior experience within different conceptual frameworks undermines any common measure by which they may compare their theories. This is what incommensurable means, no common measure. A scientific revolution then is a non-cumulative developmental episode in which an older paradigm is replaced in whole, or in part, by an incompatible new one. There isn't any overlap between the old and the new paradigms. It is like a political revolution. When paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. Like the choice between competing political institutions, choosing between competing paradigms becomes a choice between fundamentally incompatible modes of community life, scientific life. Paradigmatic differences cannot be reconciled. Theory change is a gestalt shift. That's when your perception suddenly changes. For instance, consider the famous rabbit-duck illusion. This illustrates the inescapable entanglement of perception and interpretation. You see either a duck or a rabbit never both simultaneously. And this, this profile, are we looking at a young woman 
or an older woman? Is it true the geocentrists and heliocentrists looking at the dawn see two different things? Are their views incompatible? This is what Kuhn thinks. A heliocentrist sun is at rest and a geocentrist sun is moving. This is what they perceive. Thus, heliocentrist sun can't be the same as the geocentrist sun. Sun under one description is different than the sun under another. Therefore, the object that the heliocentrist observes is not the same object that the geocentrist observes. So, there are no theory-neutral observations here. Okay, here are some problems. How unreconcilable are these views, really? Yes, the word sun shifts in meaning. Sun at rest and sun moving are vague. Nevertheless, we can make sense out of the two views about one and the same phenomenon, the dawn, when we clarify our language. Different senses of terms do not imply different reference. Realists think that the geocentrists and heliocentrists both actually see the sun, but do not see that the sun rises. The rising of the sun theory versus lowering horizon theory each interprets the same sensory experience, but each observer has different theoretical interpretations of the same sensory experience. Tycho Brahe, Danish astronomer, is blind to what Kepler sees. Nevertheless, they see, perceive the same thing, though describe and interpret it differently. Kuhn, though the world does not change with the change of paradigm, the scientist afterward works as if in a different world. I think Kuhn's being metaphorical here. They're not actually in different worlds, but they are operating in different paradigms, worldviews. Kuhn has been much misunderstood. He specifically rejected relativism both cultural and metaphysical, which he has been accused of supporting. Later scientific theories are better than earlier ones for solving puzzles in the often quite different environments to which they are applied. That is not a relativist position, Kuhn says, and it displays the sense in which I am a convinced believer in scientific progress. It's important to realize that Kuhn was not calling science irrational. His work was descriptive rather than prescriptive. That is, he was telling us how science progresses, not how it should progress. Kuhn sought to provide a fuller account of what scientific rationality involved. So the dawn is another way of describing the rising of the sun, which is another way of describing the lowering of the horizon. It's all the same phenomenon, different language, different paradigms. Tell me, Wittgenstein asked a friend, why do people always say, it was natural for man to assume that the sun went round the earth rather than that the earth was rotating. His friend replied, well, obviously because it just looks as though the sun is going around the earth. Wittgenstein replied, well, what would it have looked like if it had looked as though the earth was rotating? The point was it would have looked exactly the same. So we can't fault people for believing that the sun went around the earth. In the next lecture, which covers the next two weeks, that is, weeks 12 and 13 on the syllabus, I discuss my handout six. How does scientific explanation work? Reasoning about causes and Okasha chapter three. So read chapter three in the Okasha text and read handout six and its other connected handouts. This is the end of the slideshow.